Good morning, friends. Good morning, church in Penticton. Uh, we have our service today, and the theme is Peter, Apostle Peter, from weakness to strength. But before we go into our study, let's start with a prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we dare not to open your word without asking your Holy Spirit. First, to help, Lord, to communicate, and second, those who hear to get focused and receive the blessing that you have in your word for us today. We thank you for your Holy Spirit and for fulfilling the promise to be with us, speak to our hearts, encourage us, and strengthen and transform us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So Peter, from weakness to strength. I would like to read from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, and verse 40 to 42. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. Now what kind of person was Peter when he first, when we first meet him in the Gospels? Well, Peter stands out for a number of reasons. I would think that he would be a type of man, he would be fun to be around. A friendly man. I, I like to have him for a friend. Christian books on temperaments put him in sanguine category, which means he would be a cheerful, optimistic, enthusiastic, making friends easily, would make excellent first impression, talkative, sociable, a very nice, very nice characteristics. But backside of sanguine, there are some weaknesses, inconsistencies, easily distracted, starts out with enthusiasm, and sort of never, never completes, gets sidetracked. Goes here, goes there, everywhere. Doesn't accomplish. But backside and a good side, that's what all of us are. We have both. So here we have a Peter as portrayed in the Bible. Friendly, sincere, daring, impulsive, outspoken, generous, good husband and caring son-in-law hard-working fisherman, team person. He was a mix of a lot of good qualities, but also up and down character weaknesses. When we read Apostle Peter's two epistles, or the records of his missionary work in the book of Acts, we see a man with inner strength and focus and stability. The man, Simon Peter. But it was not always so. Peter didn't start as a very stable person. Yes, outwardly, he comes across as a man of strength, a charming, self-assured, and self-confident man in control of events, and yes, also trying to control others in every situation. But the inner Peter seems to be a different story. Deep inside, Peter seems to be an insecure man, run by his emotions and feelings, ambitions and impulsiveness. Did he know himself? His outward bravado wasn't the real Peter. In John chapter 1, verse 35 to 39, we find first two disciples who follow Jesus. After John the Baptist, second time, proclaims Jesus as the coming Lamb of God. One of these two that follow Jesus is Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Andrew is a missionary. He goes quickly to his brother Peter, 
verse 41. And tells him about Jesus, brings him to Jesus, and Peter, without hesitation, follows Jesus. Peter's name is used 162 times in the New Testament. The name Cephas or Kephas is used six times. Kephas, which is Chaldean origin name, or Peter, really literally means a stone, a rock smaller in size. Not the big and large and firm size and shape rock as is referred to God and Christ. What are the characteristics of a stone? Well, hardness, firmness, holds its shape, but also lays around, has no permanent place. Anyone can pick it up, move it around, throw it around, a little stone. Strange name Jesus gave to Simon. Kephas, a stone. Jesus chose him, a stone. If you want to shape such a stone to place it where it can fit, what would you have to do? Peter, Simon, Kephas, a stone-like person. And Jesus, the divine artist and sculptor, will work with stone-like material of Peter's character and personality. Uh, Peter was a married man, Luke 4.39. Now he, Jesus, arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. But Simon's wife, mother, which means his mother-in-law, was sick with a high fever and they made request of Jesus concerning her and Jesus heals her. Now, evidently, Peter invited Jesus and the disciples to his own home. So Peter was a sharing, hospitable person. And yes, he had a good relationship with his mother-in-law, which is really good. And according to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and 5, Cephas traveled with his wife on his missionary journeys. That's what Paul tells us. Could we say that he had a good relationship? with his wife and in his family? Seemingly or obviously, yes. There are many stories in the Gospels that give us insights into personality and character of Peter. So let's look at very few of them because there are many. Luke 5, 3 to 8. Then he, that is Jesus, got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he, that's Jesus, sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. Now when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats, so that they began to sink. When Peter Simon saw it, he fell at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am, I am a sinful man, O Lord. For one, Peter was a businessman, small businessman, a fisherman, and he worked with James and John and likely with Andrew, according to Luke 5.10. He was a team person, likely very easy to get along with, and he didn't mind to share. He was not selfish man. Even when inconvenienced, he would accommodate. So he would be a good-hearted, a generous man. Peter was the kind of what you see is what you get. No pretense. Person who shares what he has. No hidden agendas. He wants to please others. Fit in, and he always likes to speak out his mind. Why do the words 
depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Well, they were fishing the whole night and caught nothing. In Galilean Lake, you don't fish during the day. The water is so transparent. Fish see you and they'll scatter everywhere when, they, when you throw your nets in. So Peter know that you don't do fishing during the day. It just doesn't work. That's just the common sense. Peter was washing the nets, tired, likely wanted to get home, get some rest, get some sleep. He was a professional, an experienced fisherman, and this Jesus tells him what to do. He just doesn't believe it is possible. It just won't work, Jesus. But to satisfy you, I will do it. Sort of, give me a break, Jesus. Peter definitely shows his unbelief and he keeps control and he still acts politely. In his thoughts, while polite outside, is he sort of peeved out with this preacher Jesus? What a shocker are the results when he implicitly obeyed Christ's word. Lessons Peter and us have a hard time to learn. God's ways of working defy our logic and sometimes our experience. And how we think that things should be done. But when we obey and do, they always work. Matthew 14, 22 to 31, that's another story. Jesus comes to the disciples on a rescue mission. They are in the middle of the storm, in the middle of the Lake of Galilee. They are scared for their lives, and then they see Jesus coming, and they think it's a ghost. But Jesus tells them, don't be afraid, that's me. And Peter, as usually, blurts out, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come to you. And, Peter, and Jesus says, okay, come on, come. So Peter, without much thinking, he steps out and starts moving towards Jesus. Doesn't take too long, and Peter sinks in. Peter gets distracted, gets scared seeing the waves, maybe even sort of showing off a little bit, hey, look at me. Takes his eyes off Christ, loses contact with the source of his power, and under he goes, oh Lord, help. And Jesus is right there, Rescue, rescues Peter, and he will have to do it over and over and over again. Maybe a little bit like us. Good thing, Jesus is only a call away, ready to rescue us from needless situations we got into. But let's go back to Peter. As we go through the Gospels, we find Peter always up front in the lead. Self-confident, overconfident one moment, embarrassed the next. I call him a roller coaster man. Psychologists tell us that people of Peter's sort are generally insecure as they want to prove themselves, forever trying to gain acceptance, approval and respect by the things they do. In the Gospels we find many expressions like, and Peter answered, Peter said, nobody asked him, he always blurts, he always gives his opinion, he always evaluates, that's Peter. Peter always rushes into situations, has answers and solutions for everything, a spokesman for the rest. Peter likes to control every situation. His insecurity is hidden behind outward self-confidence that seems to be his driving force. In Matthew 16, 13 to 19, Peter speaks out recognizing the divinity of Christ whether he fully understood what he was saying, and he receives a commendation from Jesus. I think that might be a good idea to read it. Matthew chapter 16. Uh, Jesus uh, asks them, he takes them to the Caesarea Philippi in the northern part of Israel, 
And uh, then Jesus begins to ask them the questions. He says, well, what do other people say that I am? And uh, they said, well, some say you are John, some say this, some say that. And then Jesus says, okay, but who do you say that I am? Guess who speaks up? Of course, Peter. And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of of the living God. Now notice what Jesus says. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. It's not from you. You're not smart. You're just being open to the Holy Spirit. The whole, uh, Heavenly Father really put those thoughts into your mind and you just blurted them out. And that really is wonderful that you are percep perceptive, spiritually perceptive. perceptive. So we could say that Peter was a spiritually perceptive man. But short time after, in Matthew 16, 21, 21 and 22, after Jesus begins to tell the disciples that he has to die and he will be mistreated and die, oh, let's read it. It's... Um, Verse 21, from that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside, just two of them, and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you, but... Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. Oops. From the height of elevation, how he must have felt good about himself. And Jesus says, Peter, you know, you're so perceptive. You're, you're spiritually in tune with heaven. Peter must have felt wonderful. <laughs> And now a few minutes later, or maybe 15 minutes later, bang, he gets this severe rebuke from the Lord. Roller coaster man. I think we too, especially in our prayers, have the tendency, like Peter, to tell God what he needs to do. I'm guilty of it. I caught myself so many times in my prayers, almost dictating God what he should do for so and so and in that situation. Like, but God doesn't need wise people to advise him how he is to work. Something to consider when we pray, isn't it? Now in Matthew 17, 24, 27, Peter is lured into paying temple tax money acting again without thinking. And actually, sort of almost embarrasses Christ, but Jesus saves it. He says, okay, you know what, Peter? Go throw a line so we don't offend them. And the first fish you catch, you pull out, open its mouth, and you find the coin just exactly what it needs to be and pay the tax for you and me. So Jesus, again, saves Peter from embarrassment. What amazes me is the enormous patience, kindness, and love Jesus keeps extending to Peter. I think Jesus just loved Peter. He just loved to work with a man of that kind of personality. Jesus knows Peter through and through, and he knows you, and he knows me, and he knows all of us with all our weaknesses, with our insecurities and whatever else we are. We may not be lovable, but are loved deeply, and we are fully understood by God. During the Passover supper, disciples argue which one of them is the greatest. That seems to be their favorite pastime. Luke 22, 24 to 27. Now an argument sprang up among the disciples as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. But he, that's Jesus, told them, 
that the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But you are not to do so. On the contrary, the greatest among you should become like the youngest, and the one who leads should become like the one who serves. Because who is greater, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? It is the one at the table, isn't it? But I am among you as one who serves. And then in the upper room, again, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 31 to 35, Jesus continues, All of you will forsake me this very night, because it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. However, after I have been raised, I will go to Galilee ahead of you. But Peter again told him, even if everyone else forsakes you, I never will. Jesus told him, and I can imagine with love, compassion, and maybe with a little sadness, he tells Peter, I tell you with certainty, before a rooster crows this very night, you will deny me three times. But Peter told him, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And of course, then the choir <laughs> adds, <laughs> joins, and all the disciples said the same thing. Peter again asserts himself and argues vehemently with Jesus that he will never do such a terrible thing. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he doesn't listen to Jesus, but he sleeps. Shortly after, when the crowd comes to arrest Jesus, he's swinging his sword, cutting Malchus's ear. And again, Jesus has to step in and save Peter from dire consequences of his impulsiveness and rash action. John 8, 10 to 11. We know the story of Peter's denial the third time. It's with swearing and cursing. Luke 22, verse 61 and 62. Barely are the words outside of the mouth of Peter, denying his Lord, swearing, cursing. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Then Peter went out and wept bitterly. Now imagine how Peter must have felt about himself from that Thursday night, through the, through, through the Friday, through the crucifixion, through the Sabbath, what a Sabbath day and even on to Sunday. Thinks, think of his soul-wrenching prayers. How must he have loathed himself? Peter finally sees that apart from Christ, he really is nothing. It is after Peter's basis denial of the one who loved him the most that Peter gets broken. The self-assured, Self-confident, the overconfident, self-trusting Peter meets his moment of truth. It is that sad and uncondemning look of pity, compassion and love from Jesus in Peter's basis denial that starts the turning point of his life. And I really believe it was that look that stood between Peter probably taking his own life just like Judas. He read in the eyes of Jesus, no condemnation. Isn't that amazing? Peter didn't really know himself, did he? Now the question is, how much do we know ourselves? Outwardly, Peter was a self-assured, know-it-all, an outspoken man in charge, always confident, always strong, always control man. A kephas, the loose, pebble-like stone. On the inside, he was a bundle of insecurities, 
fears, full of self, likely some hurts from the past, bunch of human weaknesses like all of us. And Jesus loved him and kept on loving him, addressing his heart and his needs. Not much different from us, is it? It took Peter almost three and a half years walking with Jesus to realize who he really was, but also who Christ was. Peter had to crash. Perhaps we too need similar experience to face and realize who we really are. Angel told the woman on Sunday morning, go and tell his disciples and Peter, Mark 16, 7. Peter's denial has not changed Christ's attitude towards Peter. According to 1 Corinthians 15, 5, before Jesus met with the twelve in the upper room, he first appeared to Peter. So the first one he appeared was Mary Magdalene, the prostitute, the demon-possessed woman, was the first one. And the second one would be Peter. Two people, one woman, one man, who really derailed huge in their lives. And Jesus honors them and goes after them first. What a lesson for us. Heavens do care for disappointing disciples and believers. From Peter's life we learn and see the depths of God's persistent love, his amazing grace, and his never-ending mercy. It changed Peter, and I pray it changes me and you, and continues to transform us into the likeness of Christ. Peter's story teaches us to depend on Jesus moment by moment. That's our only security to keep us from falling. Much more could be gleaned from stories that involve Peter in the pages of New Testament. Now Peter is a different man. He no longer needs to prove anything to anybody. Yes, he still had some hiccups, like his experience in Galatia. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, to whom he now has submitted fully, he becomes a courageous witness for Christ. It starts from Pentecost, it goes through the book of Acts, and later on, he even is the first one who brings the gospel to the Gentiles in Caesarea. Eventually, Peter laid down his life as a courageous witness of Jesus Christ. Christian tradition says that Peter refused to be crucified the same way like Jesus. So he was crucified with his head down. Peter loved Jesus because he received amazing love of Jesus. From weakness to strength, in and through Christ, that's the story of Peter. Cephas, Cephas, the stone. Peter, the stone. In conclusion to our story, where on our learning curve with Jesus are you and me today. Let's close with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Peter is such a colorful personality. Gospels are full of Peter. And Lord, we thank you that you recorded his life, his failures, his ups and downs, because his story, in some sense, resembles our own. We thank you, Lord, for the encouragement we can have from the story of Peter in the New Testament. Two sides, before and after, but in between there was a long process of patient work 
of your love and grace on his heart and in his life. Lord, we pray that you also help us to have our eyes open, that we can really know ourselves and allow you to do the work in our lives that needs to be done and you know needs to be done. And help us also in the moments when we fail, when we crash, not to lose heart, but know that we are loved it's the same way. And you go after us even that much stronger and with a great determination to win us back to yourself. We thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.